So, uh, so quickly about myself and what I work on. So I work on this software called Jenkins. And uh, well, in this context, suffice to say, it's a server app that for developers. It's kind of hard to explain. I've never been able to successfully explain what this software is to my wife. Um, so it's what typically called a continuous integration server. Right? So the main thing in it is that it's extensible through plugins, and then the fact that it's rather easy to use and then uh, get going. And uh, me, um, so I'm the main lead developer of this project. I've been doing this since 2004. Um, 2006, the second committer joined the project. So for the first two years, I'm the lone guy that's just you know, coding this stuff up. And then in 2008, it became my day job. And then today, it's more than, we, have, we got more than 450 releases, this kind of crazy number, uh, with the 450 plus plugins that's developed by people all over the world. Uh, we have more than 300 developers in this project working in various parts of the code base, and we estimate about 27,000 installations worldwide, and each one of those is server up. So it's probably like you know, half a million users all around. Um, I met a lot of users here as well. So, um, so today what I wanted to talk about was sort of you know, how to create a developer community. So the thing is, because this project started as my hobby project, right? I have very limited amount of resources to this thing. So I have to be really creative and think hard about how to leverage other people's work into this project to make it a successful work. So um, you know, I think I have some successful recipe in there that I wanted to share with the other, I guess, the OSS developers or people thinking about developer communities. So, uh, that's the main drive of the talk because, you know, when people think of the open source projects, they tend to think of these big projects, like the well-known ones, like the one typical kind of OSS project is this company-sponsored project. The successful example that I think of is like JBoss and Spring. You know, the single company owns a lot of the workforce and they, you know, they put the code outside the firewall, but uh, it's sort of a calculated move on behalf of the company, and then it's the money that people, companies making out of it that's funding this effort, right? The other kind that's very successful is also the foundation model, like Apache and Eclipse, where they got the brand, you know, they got wannabe contributors that they want to chase, out, chase away by sticks because, they, you know, they got such a famous brand that people want to be a part of it. But most of these things you know, just doesn't work with the smaller projects like Jenkins when it was starting. So, um, so that what, what I eventually came to is this sort of what the sales or the marketing people like to use, which is a funnel model. You know, that the people, there's all, on top of the funnel, there are these visitors to your, your um, applications, and then they event, some of them turn into users, and if you're lucky, some of them would turn into developers. So the goal here, at least the way I thought of it, is that you, know, you want to sort of make this funnel as smooth as possible. I kind of think, you might think that it's well, somewhat obvious, but it's actually quite, this, this funnel is actually quite narrow for most of the people. Because initially, when someone is casually looking at their source code, you know, just a little bit of obstacle could turn them away. Like most of the core Jenkins committers today, when initially they showed up as a user, you know, they're quite casual. So let's say if some of the installation work was a bit too hard, that might be enough barrier to turn them away, and then you lose these potential contributors. And then this kind of thing goes on and goes on forever. You know, like from the users to developers, there's another obstacles there. Um, and, and because these things adds up, in, in, any, in every step you lose some people, and then so they kind of multiply. And in the end, you lose a lot of people. And then you don't see them because those lost opportunities, you don't even see them as a developer of the project. So that's what makes it hard to build this thriving community. And just to take one example, right, because again, because people don't really seem to think of this obstacle, this is just a download page of the uh, um, iTunes. Well, you might think, well, how hard it is to download the software, right? You just uh, choose the bundle and click the big download button, and then once you start downloading, they show you like what kind of things you're supposed to be doing with that software, and then that's done. And this is just two pages, but it actually, there's a lot of engineering went into it behind the scenes. So for example, right now it's showing two versions of Windows, because the server is detecting that you're accessing this from Windows, and it's not going to even show you the Mac options. Um, and then because of the crazy Internet Explorer, 
Now, actually, it's very hard to start downloading and then show you this separate page. Like, you, if, like if you go to Skype or Dropbox, they, they couldn't even figure out how to do it, right? Um, so contrast that with a typical open source project. This is one of my favorite projects. Um, well, so let's see, where is the download link here? Can you spot where they are? Oh, it turns out there's not only one, but there's one, two, three, four, five, you know, three of them, right? Can you see what those four things did? It's very hard to differentiate, even for people who know what they're doing. And if you click one of those, this is a page that they'll take you. So guess where the download link is? It's going to be a major exercise just to download this software. The correct answer is here. There is a tiny letter that says here, right? And so you'd think that this is finally start to download, but nope, not as easy. So it's going to show you this HTTPS certificate error. So you, you create, you know, you, you, you close your eyes and blindly click the proceed anyway. And then finally, you'd think to download this stuff, but not, not so quickly, just yet, right? So this is actually a download page. So you have to choose between one of those like 16 different versions of flavors that you have to download from. So that's how hard it is. Like, you know, again, um, and then, yeah. And once you start downloading, <laughs> right? So what, what am I supposed to do is download a zip file, right? And then so the, the correct answer is you have to scroll all the way down, and then there are the two links that give you the sort front page PDF that shows you how to install, and then another 50 page for how to get started. So I don't know about you, but by the time I'm going through this, this is like a day's work already. So that's the kind of opportunity cost. I and mean, people doing this project, is, it's quite smart people. It's just that this kind of thing for people working in the project becomes so obvious that they don't see it as an obstacle. But for people new to the project, you know, this is quite an obstacle. And th this is just one tiny example of the download, right? And so there are a lot more interesting things as you can imagine. So I wanted to talk a few of those things. So the one of those is actually like the user support. So this, uh, when I say user support, it mean, it, I mean like, you know, when people are having problems with the software, you need to be able to help them, right? So this is what I mean by that. And because it's, it's very important to capture people there because this is, when someone is having trouble with your software, that's actually one moment there we need to spend some time, like a you know, serious amount of time, like two hours, right? So if you can catch them into sort of potentially convert them into the developer, this is a great opportunity. So if you're targeting to a developer, the, the, the thing you want to do is to kind of push source code in front of them because they, you know, here's this, potential user, we need to spend time on your code. And if you show them the code that, that in question where it's breaking, they might just feel like, you know, looking at the code a little bit more and then even come up with a fix that eventually might be able to contribute to you. Um, and or then the next step is actually to make people read the code. And then this is also something that the, most of the developers seems to miss because again, people, existing developers of the project, their workflow is optimized against writing code, which is actually a very different exercise from like, reading the code. And like, well, for example, one of the things you can do is for a well-architected um, project, you tend to have the source code split around in so many small pieces that live in everywhere, right? But when you're reading the source code, those distinctions actually like, get in your way more than helping you. So if you, could browse, if you could show the source code in such a way that there is no such modular dis distinctions and then cut across all the stuff, then that makes it easy. And then every, because people, before they can start writing code, they need to be able to, they need to re read a lot of code. And so this is kind of, again, another step in helping them to move them into the next stage of the funnel, which is to let them hack code. But again, you know, this is where a lot of projects seems to miss our opportunities. For example, a lot of times I get frustrated about being unable to figure out where to check out the source code, like in some of the Eclipse projects, they did it do a good job of hiding that link. So, well, if you can't even check out the code, then I mean, what's, the, what's the chance of my contributing back to the project, right? Or the building and running and testing it, it's, there's all these steps that like, so easily could turn people away. And then, again, making these things easy would be uh, very useful. Um, so the common pitfalls there is like you have a lot of prerequisites uh, about like, the software that needs to be installed before you could even build the thing. Or like when you miss some of those, the build script would fail in very cryptic way and then you'd be wasting like 30 minutes just to figure out one missing dependencies. That's all too common. Um, the, second, the other point of sort of encouraging contribution is to modularize your code. Um, you know, your big applications, any application of non-trivial size needs to be split down 
into pieces that are individually comprehensible and useful. And there are multiple reasons, I mean, not the least of which is that it's actually good software engineering to do it anyway. But um, the point is, you know, the, the, there are a lot more people who would be interested in smaller pieces that, that doesn't care about the overall thing that you do. But, but every of those little contributors that only care about those small pieces, that's win to you. That they, they represent a substantial number of users behind them. For each developer that's contributing to your project, it represents a lot of users. And then when they can help in a little piece that, you know, that, that your stuff also built on top of, that makes it, you know, that lets you leverage a lot, of, a lot bigger potential pool of developers. Another thing that also of, I often see missing in the software is this notion that everything needs to be reusable by another program. Right? So I guess when, earlier today there was a talk about the APIs and so on, which I think would fall into the same category. But like this application server that I mentioned earlier, you know, people often forget that they, they need to be driven by other things, like the Cloud Foundry, for example, would be driving app server. But if they don't have an API, that makes it impossible. And every time when someone, every time one developer was able to successfully build on top of you, that again represents hundreds of users. So that's all the more um, users on top of your platform, and then that helps you scale. Um, another reason I guess this is important is because the developers are very opinionated, somewhat antisocial people, right? So it's kind of like the chef. You don't want to having too many of them working in the same code base because they start to fight each other. So the, the idea is that you give everyone their own sandbox that they can be happily play with and make sure that those sandbox combine together nicely. And then uh, that sort of, to, el to elaborate on that point a little bit more, um, that's why this, we should be preferring the division of labor as opposed to collaboration, especially when it comes to programming. Um, because you know, the communication is, is quite painful, frankly, um, especially when we are talking about the project that's spread around the, the globe, because time zone, despite all these technical, technological improvement, isn't disappearing. And everyone has their own opinions about you know, where the white space should come, whether the bracket should be on the same line as if statement, the other things like whether the you know, inversion of a control is a good thing, or like particular programming language is good or bad. So like it's, it's just so easy to get stuck with those bike shedding arguments and then prevent, that prevents making progress. So, um, and then this is particularly true for the open source projects where they don't share any context. You know, like this person that's trying to work on this code is only known to you by their handle name. Whereas, you know, in, in the real company or the, the corporate environment, you know the person, right? So at least that helps you lubricate the conversation a little bit to make, you know, make progress but it's not so easy for OSS. So um, in short, the collaboration simply doesn't scale. Like every DevOps who wants to contribute on your project, you have to spend some time with the person. And so ultimately, that's what's going to kill your productivity. So in that sense, the silo is actually a good thing for the software development, and then that's what by modularity we mean. But, but another way to phrase it is this extensibility, also known as the plugins that makes all the world, all the difference. So even when I look at the successful project, I'm just looking at uh, some of those I mentioned uh, from the Java land, but you know, all these successful projects has this notion of building plugins, which is a way of giving everyone their own sandbox to play with. And then in my mind, this is the single most important requirement for building a developer community as opposed to the user community, right? So uh, the extensibility, I think, is really the logical consequence of the modularity. If you take the modularity to its extreme, you get to the point this, of this extensibility. And then the idea is that the, the whole thing, when you combine all these plugins, they should feel like a single coherent software to your users. A lot of people claim that they got the extensibility, but they got these points wrong. So for example, I see some people having API, extensibility API for the plugins that's actually different from what their internal users are using. Right, so that's, that's clearly not a good sign. Or the fact that um, you know, they sometimes what the plugins can do is visibly distinct, different from what the, the core does. Like if you look at some of the Outlook add-ons, they look very different from the core features. So that's a bad anti-sign. Um, so in the end, if you, got the, if you got to the point that the core code is living by the exact same rules and the API that you are letting your plugin developers use, and then I think that's when you can say you got the real extensibility point. 
And the reason this is important is, like I said, the uh, you know, developers are quite antisocial. That, um, so everyone has all different tastes about what they should be doing. So the, good, so the best thing you can do is like, you don't want to even see what other guys are doing. Right? So when someone comes up with uh, crazy ideas, the, the, the thing you want to say is that's a great idea. Please do it in the plugin in places that I don't see, as opposed to like, fight with your arguments. So, um, by, by doing that, ultimately, it's going to be a whole lot more scalable because it only has like zero overhead to you, right? When someone does a plugin, you don't really have any additional cycles. So um, I guess I need to hurry up a little bit. Um, yeah, but the, ex the, thing, the, the last thing, point I wanted to mention is that the extensivity alone is not enough for you. That is, you need some kind of gravity, center of the gravity for the community to work as a community because otherwise, Everyone will do it in their own places. Like AMP is a good example. There's a lot of AMP extensions, but they are done all over the places. So there's no coherent sort of community that cre creates the sustainability when people move on to the other things. So that's what makes the Jenkins uh, unique that we got the center of the gravity. Um, and uh, the, um, so finally, I wanted to mention about this lowering barrier to the entry because you know, remember the fundamental model that you want to make everything as easy as possible. So in Jenkins, we, we allow everyone to have a commit access just by asking. And that's only possible because we got this silo approach of plugins, right? So whatever wacky programmer we get, they're isolated to this little portion of the code. And as a whole, it does a good thing. So um, in conclusion, um, yeah, I wanted to, there are many shapes and forms to the open source projects, so you should really think about the one that fits you instead of just blindingly follow the big ones. Um, and the coding is just actually one piece of it, so the creating a social structure for the contribution is a very important part of it. And then, you know, just try to make everything easy relentlessly, and then that, when you make every step easy enough, then the developer community would follow you. So with that, I wanted to, uh, uh, so that's the end of it. Thank you.